As of today, I will be living here at Mother Base. Now my real trial begins. Zadornov was paying my room, board, and tuition, but he has since been captured. I told the man that with no more money from the KGB, I could no longer afford school. He bought my story, and when I said I would be willing to work, he took pity on me and let me stay. For some reason, Miller really pled my case. That was helpful, but the man is still a fool. His men are no better. They think their training makes them strong, but that kind of strength is nothing in the face of true power. And better yet, they wait on me hand and foot, believing I am just a schoolgirl. Looks like I won't be working too hard after all. Just today, while scouting out the living quarters, I saw a group of them in the corner of the deck making a fuss. Going over for a look, I saw they were feeding a kitten. A bunch of grown hard men, and they are the ones acting like schoolgirls. Look, isn't he cute? What is wrong with them? Disgusted, I just nodded and smiled. I must stay in character after all. I indulged their chit chat for a few moments. Then one of them asked me to give the thing a name. They had just taken it from its mother. I named it Nuke. I improvised some nonsense about how our compassion for living things can help prevent wars. The men gave me a little fish. I held it out in my palm and the kitten happily ate it up. What a pathetic, feeble creature. It sickens me. Today, Chico invited me to go fishing with the soldiers. I suppose finding one's own food does have its merit but I prefer not to be involved in such a degrading task. And their prattling on about fishing being fun is nonsense. I'm not here to find playmates. Nevertheless, distasteful as it was, I went along in order to maintain my cover. Chico thrust a fishing pole into my hands, and we went up onto the deck where several soldiers had gathered. They welcomed us warmly. With so few women aboard Mother Base, I'm treated like a princess. No one suspects I am neither a teenager nor a student. It was nice and sunny, with a gentle breeze and waves. As I cast my line and waited for a bite, the soldiers began to ask me all sorts of questions. As always, I answered according to our predefined scenario, feigning a smile. As I sat there feeding them lies, the fish began to bite and the soldiers began to focus on their prey. Chico had his bait stolen by a fish and got so angry that he stood up and nearly fell into the sea. Everybody laughed. It almost made me want to join in too. At some point, I got a bite myself. The instant after I felt that first gentle tug, the fish yanked the line with astonishing strength and I let out a cry of surprise. I thought he was going to be huge. It was my first time fishing, and I was a bit flustered, so the soldier beside me helped by supporting the pole from behind. Reel it in, they shouted. I nodded, turning the handle as fast as I could. I wondered what kind of fish lived below the surface, and thought back to the deep sea dives I had to do as part of training. Those were difficult days, but I remember finding the multicolored fish gliding through the water incredibly soothing. After a hard fight, I pulled it up. To my surprise, it wasn't even half a vara. Rather anticlimactic. But I wasn't doing it for fun, so I wasn't the least bit disappointed. Nuke was hovering nearby with an expectant look on his face, so I gave the fish to him. All in all, a thoroughly wasted day. Preparations are coming along nicely. No one suspects me of being the one to let Zadarnov out of his cell. Today, Amanda and I taught Cecile how to make gallo pinto. It is a simple home-cooked dish consisting of black frijoles mixed with arroz. It is well known throughout Central America, not just in Costa Rica. So it is no surprise that a Nika like Amanda would be good at making it. But I was raised in the States from a very young age and could hardly even remember my mother's gallo pinto. 
having to make chit chat with that clueless bird lover and the so called revolutionary was excruciating. And, clueless or not, I wanted to be especially careful around Cecile, the one who actually recorded that tape. Thankfully, Miller and his men seemed to believe I mistook the tape I found for one my friend made. In any case, one can never be too careful. Anyway, the three of us minced garlic and herbs, then cooked them in a pot with frijoles we'd soaked overnight. While waiting for them to cook, we sautéed onions and arroz in a frying pan. Cecile worked the frying pan according to Amanda's directions, but seemed a bit glum. She does have a knack for cooking, though. She is French, after all. We added water to the pan and watched the arroz begin to steam. While we waited, Amanda shared memories of her mother with us. They had been separated because of Simosa, but the taste of her mother's cooking was still fresh in her mind. When the frijoles were ready, we drained the water, stir-frying them with the rest of the vegetables. Quite a complicated process for home cooking. Nonetheless, it kept them occupied. The longer we sat and talked, the greater the chance of my arousing their suspicions. With women, it is not enough to just bat your eyelashes and giggle. It takes a lot of effort to divert attention. When the arroz was done cooking, we folded it into the frijoles and added salsa stirring the mixture as it simmered. At this point, for some reason, the conversation turned to romance. Why does it have to be that way whenever women get together and chat? Cecile fancies herself to be well-versed in such matters and gave Amanda all sorts of advice. It was harmless enough, until, to my irritation, she began pestering me whether there was anybody I liked. Not right now, I said, trying to dodge the question. But she pressed on. It's Snake, isn't it? I gritted my teeth and played it coy. Maybe. Cecile nodded and giggled. He is pretty sexy, isn't he? What a ditz. It's all I can manage to just survive. The thought of romance has never once crossed my mind. I have no interest in that kind of man. Soon enough, a rich aroma began to fill the room. The gallo pinto was ready. Nuke came over and rubbed up against our legs, looking for a handout. Unfortunately, it was not the kind of food a cat would like. We let a few of the soldiers have a bite, and then headed off to the mess hall. The home-cooked flavor we'd achieved was a big hit with the men of MSF. Not that we are trying to impress them or anything. Even I could manage a dish like that. Snake enjoyed it too. Let me make this absolutely clear. I have no interest in that man. Football, or soccer as it is known in the States, is extremely popular here. It has not caught on yet in the US, but it has legions of rabid fans all across Latin America. These fans can get so rowdy that it is commonly believed El Salvador and Honduras went to war in 1969 over scuffles in a soccer match. In reality, tensions between the two countries were already high. The match was merely one of the sparks that set them off. But these people are so passionate about this sport that the story seems plausible. Predictably, many of the soldiers here are fans. They have apparently divided themselves into Costa Rican and Nicaraguan teams and started playing each other. To play, you need a ball and two goals. The R&D team built and set up simple goals on the deck. I had absolutely no interest, but Chico insisted that I come and watch. It was not a proper match by any means. The pitch was not even regulation size, but the players and spectators alike got pretty excited. They banged empty cans and shouted cheers through the handmade megaphones. It almost felt like carnival. Huey, the referee, blew a whistle to start the match. The soldiers' training has left them in excellent physical shape, but they lack the honed skills of professionals and their play was quite rough. Midway through, one of the men collided with another. They started shouting at one another, but Huey stepped in. I thought we had forsaken our countries, become one with the earth, he said, quoting Snake. We are not competing for national pride here, and we are not fighting for the good of any one country. This is not a war. 
soccer is a peaceful sport, am I right? The soldiers nodded. They know the pain of war, and they share Snake's vision. Perhaps that is why all this resonates with them. Team Costa Rica was down a man, and somehow, I was picked to fill in. Costa Rica had the advantage up until that point. I suppose Huey wanted to keep it balanced. The soldiers agreed with Huey's call. Maybe the Costa Rican players felt an even matchup would be more fun too. I could not be bothered to run at first, but chasing the ball out there in the hot sun, I was soon drenched in sweat. Before long, I found myself actively seeking out the ball, partially out of desperation. I picked up a loose ball deep on the opponent's side of the field. Even though he's Nicaraguan, Chico cheered me on, yelling, Go for it! Shoot! I launched the ball as hard as I could, only to have it blocked by the keeper. Disappointment only increased my determination. In the end, I didn't score a single goal, and Costa Rica gave up its lead. It was really close, though. We congratulated each other on a good match and sprawled out in the shade on the deck. Exhausted. The ocean breeze felt so nice on my sun-soaked body. Nuke came over. It is one of his favorite spots. And stretched out next to me. And together, we watched fluffy white clouds drift lazily across the clear blue sky. It was lovely out today. So I decided to sun myself in a lounge chair up on the deck when strange love came up to me. Despite the heat, she was in her usual long sleeves and pants. I waved at her. She looked away and mumbled, H Hello there. Fancy meeting you here. I asked if she needed anything, feeling her eyes creeping up and down my body like she was savoring it. Finally, she swallowed and said, You have such beautiful skin. Bewildered, I shook my head and said, No, not at all. I had heard rumors that she was a lesbian. But she couldn't be after me, could she? She continued to stare and said, No, it is beautiful. But you must not let yourself get so tanned. And then she took my hand in hers. What is wrong with a little son, I asked, trying to cut the conversation short. But she shook her head violently. No, you mustn't. A young lady should take better care of her skin. She was acting strangely now, as if aroused. She lectured me on the perils of tanning, how it ages skin, causing wrinkles and spots, and in the worst cases, even skin cancer. I knew already that tanning could cause spots, but I thought only pale-skinned Anglo-Saxons had to deal with that. Having a scientist tell me it causes aging, though, that spooked me a little. If I am to keep playing the teenager, I will have to start paying more attention to my skin. Sensing my anxiety, she took a small tube from her pocket. She said it was the sunscreen she always used. She told me to keep it. I didn't know what to say. I was more than happy to take it, but exactly what were her intentions? Was she merely being nice, or is she really into me? Either way, there was no reason to refuse, I suppose. I have undergone training. An out-of-shape woman does not pose any real threat to me. Having power means not being afraid. It is the same on a global scale. A country with nukes can dictate terms to a country without them. I thanked her and took the tube. Then she offered to put some on for me. She squirted some lotion onto her fingers and began rolling it into my chest. It happened so suddenly, and I was so taken aback that I did not even think to protest. She caressed my stomach with her long white fingers, then slid them upwards between my bikini-clad breasts. What? Wait! I sputtered as her moist eyes met mine. She was beautiful. Somehow, I found myself captivated by this woman more than ten years my elder. Hold still, she whispered in my ear. I nodded silently, unable to refuse. My body went limp, motionless, 
as if in a trance. Gently, carefully, she rubbed the lotion all over my entire body. I shouldn't have enjoyed it, and yet I could not help myself. For a moment, I was spellbound. That woman is dangerous. I had better watch myself. Protecting one's health is an important part of any agent's job. But despite my best efforts, I have caught a cold. Now that I think about it, Mother Base's numbers are on the rise, with soldiers coming from all different places and backgrounds. It is no wonder then that sooner or later someone would bring in a virus. That said, what I have got is just a common cold. The medical team said I'd need a few days rest, so I've been restricted to my room and put on bed rest. I thought I'd gotten used to not having anyone around to relate to, but at times like these, being alone is just miserable. All I could do is lay there and stroke Nuke's back, trying to take my mind off how bad I felt. Nuke just sat there, not making a sound. But I did have visitors, Amanda and Chico, Huey, Cecile, Miller, and a few of the soldiers I've become relatively close to. Amanda made me a soup with herbs she said were good for a cold. Miller told me to take it easy. I will sing you a lullaby, he said, then broke out a guitar and sang some incomprehensible song in Japanese. I did not need to understand the lyrics to know he is an awful singer. Then he said, you know what is good for a cold? Suppositories. Here, I'll show you. He began to take off his pants, so I threw my tissue box at him to make him go away. Then, Strange Love showed up, saying she had some miracle Indian cure. It is got eucalyptus extract, she said. It works best if you rub it into your chest. And then, she tried to take off my nightshirt. I whacked her with my pillow, and then got rid of her. Chico brought me a little flower in a cup. It had been growing in a little bit of earth that probably found its way on board stuck to something else. I found this on the deck. Here, you can have it. He tried to act nonchalant, but I am pretty sure he's got a crush on me. None of them understand. If they thought these little visits would cheer me up, they were wrong. Tonight, Snake himself came to my room. Like the rest, he believes I am just a schoolgirl and treats me as such. Why did you abandon your country? I asked him. Why create the MSF? Of course, I knew the answers already, but I wanted to hear it from him. As I had imagined, he was not exactly forthcoming. All he would say is that his country abandoned him, because all he could do was fight. And that is why he needed the MSF, because that is all he is any good for. Then he said, fighting is the only thing I understand, but that does not mean I have got a grudge against those who believe in peace. I am not one of them, and I do not believe in peace. Conflict is in man's nature. We fight our enemies in order to survive. Maybe we are not so different after all, he and I. But that is exactly why I'm going to have to kill him. Or else he will have to kill me. When I stop and think about this wretched existence, being killed by a man like that suddenly does not seem like such a bad thing. Every month, Mother Base throws a party for all the soldiers whose birthdays fall in that month. There is something strange about a military organization having parties. Really though, it is just an excuse to drink and make noise. It is not easy to get alcohol in a fortress in the middle of the ocean. Most days they are training from dawn till dusk. They do not have time for things like drinking. That is why Snake and Miller came up with the idea to give everyone a chance to let loose. Obviously, a bunch of boards like that are not going to bother with blowing out candles on a cake. Rather, they sit there in a cloud of cigarette smoke drink beer, eat meat, tell tasteless jokes, and swap crude insults about one another's hometowns. But it hardly ever breaks out into something serious. They talk up a storm, but they're just having fun. 
It is funny. You have got members of FSLN rubbing shoulders with the UCLA's. People who once would have considered the other mortal enemies. I wonder if that is what makes Big Boss so popular. In leaving their countries behind, they leave their hatred for other countries too. Miller seemed a little protective of me. Hope they're not being too crude, he said. But soon enough, he too was drunk. He yelled, come here and take a look at the real Kazuhira Miller. Then dropped his pants and mooned everybody. The other soldiers burst out laughing. I have never seen such a crude, ridiculous party before. And yet, all these people laughing and acting the fool. Is this what they call peace? For some reason, I began to think about all that has happened since I came here. Fishing with Chico, cooking with Amanda and Cecile, playing soccer, having visitors when I caught a cold. When I stop and think about it, my time here has been the most peaceful of my life. But that is about to end. I cannot imagine he will be willing to negotiate. It seems I am to fight the legendary Big Boss. I do not know if I'll be able to beat him. But if I have to choose between death and defying Cypher, I will gladly choose death. The thought of dying does not scare me. But if I disobey my orders, the fear and despair awaiting me will be far worse than anything I can imagine. It was Cypher who took me in as an orphan, gave me food and a place to live. His orders may have been unreasonable, but I will never repay my debt entirely. It seems I have no choice. I must fight this man. I must fight Snake. Do you know Miller? Snake's right-hand man? Apparently has got at least one serious weakness. He is an insatiable womanizer. He does not bother me, most likely because he considers teenagers off-limits. But he has hit on every single one of the few female soldiers here at Mother Base. They ought to be telling him where to stick it but end up falling for it so easily. I think some of it stems from the fact that he is actually not that bad looking. Anyway, today, that nasty habit got him in trouble. He and Snake got into one of their rare fights, and I was there to see it. They burst out of the showers completely naked, trading punches. I am no child. The sight of a naked man does not make me blush, but this was something else. Maybe this'll teach you, Snake yelled as he slammed his fists into Miller's chest. I heard later that apparently he'd been two-timing someone, and that same someone had gone to Snake with her troubles. As I see it, it is her own fault for letting herself be deceived like that. If she is too dumb to see through Miller's lies, then she got what she deserved. But this was not the first time it had happened, or the second. And Snake read Miller the riot act. Miller argued back. And what began as a shouting match turned into a fist fight. You son of a bitch, Miller yelled as he swung. Not bad, said Snake, smiling, but not good enough. And then he was back on the offensive. They had already been at it pretty hard in the showers, and their bodies were covered with bruises. Both of these men had been trained for war, their bodies deadly weapons. They were each bleeding from a dozen places. All this from a fist fight. Even so, it was far less gruesome than if they had given it their all. It was obvious that one of them would be dead were they fighting for real. Miller took another swing, yelling, Try this then! Snake parried, then responded in kind. But I could tell he was not aiming for anything vital. You are one tough bastard, boss, Miller muttered. A smile crept across his face as he caught his breath. And then they went right on fighting. Blood and sweat flew off their glistening bodies. It was combat without hatred or hostile intent. I had never seen violence like this before. And yet, it was more than just a friendly tussle. They were utilizing every technique they knew. It was not a sporting match. They were not playing by the rules. How could they keep this up? At last, the two men tired themselves out, and the bizarre scene came to an end. They looked at each other's battered bodies and then burst out laughing, embracing and congratulating each other on a good fight. It all seemed so idiotic. 
I still cannot fathom such behavior. But somehow, I got the sense that for all his womanizing, Miller really only trusted one person, and that was Snake. There was no way I could ever come between the two of them. And at that thought, I began to feel as if I had lost. All of Mother Base is preparing for a festival. Since Snake and his soldiers spend so much time fighting, they are setting aside one day a year for peace and relaxation. I do not know all the details, but apparently that is what Snake and Miller decided. These soldiers love the idea, of course. There is so little fun to be had here that everybody looks forward to events like these. That is all well and good, but somehow I got roped into getting on stage. Come on, we even both have peace in our name, said Miller. And Zadarnath, that old Ruski's name, has something to do with peace too, right? Hey, as long as we are having a day of peace, we ought to get an act together. The Three Peace Band. I thought he was joking. He then proceeded to share his idea without bothering to check with me. And now, I am slated to sing. Apparently, he had heard me on the deck one day, and since then he's wanted to form a band. Everybody's looking forward to it, so there is no way for me to back out now. I have never done anything like this, but it does feel kind of nice to know that people are looking forward to it. I mean, it cannot be any worse than Mueller singing, but modifications to Zeke are already finalized, and I must complete my mission. Betray Sai for now and I will face a fate far worse than death. Still, there is no need to put things in motion just yet. What difference would it make to just wait a little while longer? A whole day of peace. The mission can wait until after that. Can it not? I know I am only delaying the inevitable. When the day comes, one of us will have to die. Snake or me. But still, if I could just come up with some way to stall Cypher, at least until our day of peace. Ugh. When did I start having thoughts like this? My cover is blown. They know nothing of Cypher or my true objective. But they know I am a spy. There is no more time left. I must act now. I must complete my mission. How did it come to this? All I wanted was three more days. Just three. Miller's already finished writing the song. It is called Love Deterrent. It is about a girl who cannot express her true feelings. I have been practicing. I am no pro, but I was pretty sure I would do a decent job. And now this. Cypher found out that Zeke was complete. He must have someone inside Mother Base besides me spinning his tightly wound web of control, leaving no room for individual will. Typical. When they found out Zeke was complete, I was ordered to execute the operation immediately. If I was going to enjoy just one day of peace, I had to ensure the plan could not move forward. I tried to sabotage Zeke. I thought by damaging the drive system, they would have no choice but to delay their plans. I waited until midnight and then snuck into the hangar. There would be trouble if it looked like sabotage. I selected one of the drive system's load-bearing parts and carefully worked to warp its shape. The legs drive system requires a high degree of precision to operate. Even the smallest deviation would have done it. Then, Chico walked in. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those nights where he could not sleep. In any case, he saw me, panicked, and took off running. It would have been easy to kill him, but I could not. I know he likes me. It is not as if I would ever have an interest in a child like him, but I could not pull the trigger. Not at him, not in the back. Will he tell them? Or is there a chance he will keep it a secret? Protect me? No, he knows now knows I am not who he thought I was. He ran without even questioning what I was doing. There is no chance he does not know. And soon, all I have built here will end. 
And if Cypher has another agent among them, if he finds out I tried to sabotage Zeke, this place will no longer be my heaven. Then it is settled. I make my move now. Chico walked in before my sabotage was complete, so Zeke should still be operational. It might not run at full speed or power, but I do not have time to fix that. Without Zeke, I do not have a chance in hell of winning. I must act fast before Chico sounds the alarm. I knew it would come to this. <laughs> I just did not think it would be so soon. <laughs> It is time, Zeke. Metal Gear Zeke, activate. Pass's tapes. Yeah. Why do you think she'd leave him behind? And that diary? Whatever it was, her commitment was wavering. That much is clear. So she was leaving clues? To help us? No way to know for sure. And the ocean's not giving her back. November 4th, 1974. At the outskirts of Barranquilla, Colombia. Contact with Big Boss successful. Zadornov posed as my professor, but Big Boss took one look and knew he was KGB. However, he does not seem to suspect me. To him, I am just a peace-loving student, and another victim of the CIA. We asked him to drive the CIA out of Costa Rica. To him, this means betraying his country. His forces are smaller than anticipated. They drift from place to place with nowhere to call home. That provided us an opportunity, so we seized it. Zdornov offered them a plant off the Costa Rican coast to use as a base. As expected, Miller jumped at the chance. Although initially reluctant, Big Boss came around when Zdornov played him the tape. All because the voice on it sounded like his mentor, the boss. Naked Snake. The man who once saved the world from the brink of nuclear war. I awarded the title of Big Boss for his service. He later became a mercenary, abandoning both his title and his country. To him, that honor was steeped in the blood of the boss, the mentor he was forced to eliminate. Exceptionally charismatic, he possesses unparalleled combat and intelligence gathering abilities. His only discernible weakness is... Her. This operation hinges on how effectively we can exploit that. Kazuhira Miller is Big Boss's lieutenant. Half Japanese, half American. He once served in Japan's self-defense force. Though he and Snake first met as enemies, they discovered a common bond and together built their private army, with Miller directing business and administrative affairs. He comes off as shallow, but his true intent is hard to read. I must be careful. All that is clear is his infatuation with Big Boss. With East and West fighting over its control, Central America is now the most contested region on Earth. CIA Central American Station Chief Coldman has developed Peace Walker, a fully AI-automated, fail-deadly nuclear launch system with which he aims to reignite the Cold War. Snake's new objective in Costa Rica is to prevent that. Zadornov's, or should I say, the KGB's plan is to play the two sides against each other, turning the entire region red. Not one of the three parties realize they're all just pawns in Cypher's hands. Cypher watches all. Mother Base has developed rapidly since being established in the Caribbean Sea. They recruit more personnel daily, and already their mercenary services are turning a profit. Big Boss's leadership and charisma, and Miller's business acumen drive this impressive growth. Furthermore, 
Joining forces with a faction of the FSLN has expanded their power even more. They have even commenced their own weapons development program. All is proceeding according to Cypher's will. I could not be more pleased. Snake's pursuit of Peace Walker led him to an AI modeled after the boss's thought patterns. It was incomplete, but somewhat ironically, making contact with Snake was the necessary finishing touch. Meanwhile, the scientist behind Peace Walker's locomotive control, Huey, defected to Snake's army. His presence has greatly accelerated weapons development at Mother Base. I failed to anticipate Coldman's madness, but nuclear war was averted. However, this was only after the boss AI on board Peace Walker sank itself to the bottom of the lake in what could be likened to suicide. The boss laid down her gun, choosing to sing for peace instead, and Snake, himself a gun, parted ways with her. In doing so, he reclaimed the title he once abandoned. He is Big Boss. Zadornov has been detained. Since this leaves my cover identity without a guardian, the Mother Base staff has taken me in. I am now better placed than ever to monitor their internal affairs. Everything continues to unfold according to plan. The developer of the boss AI, Dr. Strangelove, has also come to Mother Base. With her and Huey's expertise, they can now develop a weapon capable of matching Peace Walker. Development on the bipedal weapon is now complete. They call it Metal Gear Zeke. It stands there like some sort of mystical guardian. The soldiers gaze on it with pride and reverence. Big Boss has elected to arm it with a nuclear weapon. As an army without a nation, they seem to feel the need for a deterrent against whatever the world might pit against them. It is a dangerous gambit. Why do such a thing? Their nuclear strategy differs from the Americans and the Soviet Union. The superpowers deter attack by revealing their nuclear arsenals to one another. Snake and his men know that if they were to go public with this, the whole world would unite against them. Business would dry up overnight. So they do not plan on revealing the nuke until necessary. This ace in the whole approach is their idea of a nuclear strategy. Wielding a deterrent, all the while unable to reveal its existence. I wonder if Snake sees how vulnerable this makes them. Yes. Hijack Zeke? Yes, I did indicate that to be our leverage. But I cannot imagine his agreeing to that now. But did you not raise them to safeguard your governance without borders? No, no. I have not forgotten. Cypher watches all. Yes, things are proceeding, but modifying Zeke has not proven easy. I am using Zadornov to buy some time. No, I have not forgotten what you said. However... Well, forgive me for asking, but... This is you I am speaking to, isn't it? Cypher? I must. I will fight Big Boss. The world must be ruled by a single will. To defy Cypher is a fate worse than death. This is a one-man infiltration mission, boss. Equipment is the bare essentials. Anything else will be OSP. The target location is a prison camp on a U.S. military base. Those Marines have the place locked down tight. Your only backup will be one extraction chopper. We can't send anything else. You won't need to. Again, this is infiltration, a sneaking mission. Your number one priority is remaining undetected. Use discretion before engaging any guards you encounter. Be mindful of their sensory perceptions, sight, sound, smell, and pain. Fortunately, these atmospheric conditions will continue until dawn. That should provide you with some cover. At least the weather's on my side. Your mission objective is to rescue Chico and Paz. According to Chico, 
They're both being held at an old prison facility. Recon from the intel unit supports this, so it's safe to assume that's where they are. Once you've gotten them to the RV, call in the extraction chopper. I'll monitor the situation and offer guidance from here, but you'll be the one in the field. How you handle this mission is entirely up to you, boss. Snake, yesterday we received official communication from the IAEA. It says, it has come to our attention that your organization recently purchased nuclear fuel from Uzbekistan authorities. We request permission to inspect your facilities. What a load of bullshit. Yeah, they're after Metal Gear Zeke's nuclear warhead. I'm betting this is payback from Cypher after Paz's leak. Using the UN. There's no telling how much influence they have. But the IAEA can only do inspections in countries that are party to the NPT. And we're not a country. Exactly. We haven't signed a safeguards agreement with the IAEA over peaceful nuclear use, and we're not obligated to report any nuclear material we have, nor information about any nuclear facilities. The IAEA has no authority to inspect us. But despite all that... That nuke's our last line of defense. We don't want to announce we have it until the world is preparing to wipe us off the map. Until then, we let everyone think we're just a private army with conventional firepower. What's Huey's take? That the problem's how to hide the nuke in Metal Gear. But I gotta tell you, he was all for it. I see. But there's no way we can have the IAEA poking around here. So what do we do? Ignore them? Send them an official letter of refusal. Say that we're a private organization and we've done nothing to attract the suspicion. You got it. We finished Zeke's waterproofing reinforcement yesterday. The day after tomorrow, we'll be done installing the main depth control tank, the compressed air tank, and the attitude control propeller pod. Huey. If the underwater test goes well, next week we'll try the 300-foot seabed depth. Drop the act, Huey. How do we end up agreeing to the nuclear inspection? Because after you sent that letter, I told them. After careful reconsideration, we agree to your request. And frankly, we should be inspected. This is our chance. If they come and go without discovering the nuke, we can tell the world we're clean. Of course, it's risky, and we'll have to make sure everything's perfect, but it'll be worth it. Huey, can they do an inspection without going through the Board of Governors? We contacted the IAEA's admin branch, and they said there's no record of us being brought up at any of the board's meetings. I'd say probably a preliminary inspection to determine whether we should be referred to the board. So it's bound to be a small inspection team, and they won't be here that long. Don't worry. Leave everything to me. Has the media gotten wind of this? Yeah. Two major Western networks want to do stories on us. I planned on saying yes. What? You want to broadcast this place to the world? That's why I agreed to the inspection. This is a golden opportunity. We can use the media to prove to the world we don't have a nuke. Besides, even if we said no, it would just be delaying the inevitable. Ugh, Kaz, our hands are tied now. Start getting the place ready. Thanks, boss. Don't get the wrong idea. You set it up so that any more changes of heart will arouse suspicion, that's all. <sighs> Zeke stays. But we'll have to move all other AFVs to shore. Any potential troublemakers can go with them for some mandatory R&R. Sound good, boss? Just do it. About the inspection, what do we tell the men? The truth. What else? The one thing we don't need to worry about is anyone here spilling the beans about Zeke. Good point. What about the Sandinistas? There's still quite a few of them left on the base. I hate to say it, but it won't look good having Soviet bloc personnel here. The problem is, moving a group that size in a hurry would look even worse. At least Amanda's on assignment in Cuba. They'd recognize her. She should stay put for now. All civilians save Huey will have to return to their countries. Even your Parisian? Of course. We'll get her whatever paper she needs. Dr. Strangelove's departure came at a perfect time. The less Zeke-related staff here, the better. Wait, she left? That's right. You were away on a mission. She left last week. There's nothing cooking in AI weapons research, and Zeke is complete. There was really no reason for her to hang around. I'm surprised Huey let her go that easy. Yeah, his crush on Strangelove was never much of a secret, huh? He followed her everywhere while Zeke was in development. Boy, would she get pissed. But he does have a lot on his mind right now. 
I've got bigger issues to deal with. That's what he said. That's the spirit, Huey. Ten days ago, we got reports that Poss was still alive. She survived. She was rescued by a Belizean fisherman who found her drifting in the Caribbean. So what's the plan? Silence her before we're compromised? No. I've got something else in mind. Our friends at Cypher suspect Poss could be a double agent. She's being held for interrogation at a camp on the southern tip of Cuba. Black site. Nice. A slice of American pie on communist soil, and out of U.S. legal jurisdiction. The upcoming inspection of Mother Base has to be connected somehow. The timing's too perfect. The U.N.'s nuclear inspection. My guess is they're trying to corroborate Poss's leak. We're an army without a nation. Word of our capabilities gets out, and we'll have the whole world out to shut us down. Having an American private intelligence agency involves bad news. Cypher's the ones who sent Poss to us in the first place. She knows their true nature. Right. Poss is our only link to Cypher. If she's still alive, we need her on our side. If not us, who else is gonna rescue that bitch? When do we do it? The inspection comes first. We'll deal with us afterwards. Do the men know? Word has started to spread. The information came from Cuba through Amanda. One of the base personnel used to belong to El Frente. I'll tell everyone we don't concern ourselves with the survival of enemy spies. We need them focused on the inspection. And if we get her back here and she isn't cooperative, there's still plenty of room for her in the ocean. Works for me. What about Chico? He had a chance to stop Paz from hijacking Zeke and he blew it. He's carried that guilt ever since. Kid really did care about her. Chico, it's hard to say how he'll react. Have Amanda call him out to Cuba. He shouldn't be here right now. Good idea. They haven't seen each other in a while. Little time with Big Sis and he'll forget all about you know who. What? Still no sign of Chico? What's going on? It's Amanda in Cuba. Our resupply package arrived, but Chico wasn't with it. Relax, Amanda. I'm sure he's just exploring Havana or something. First time in the big city. Could have gotten carried away. Koss, wait. The boat Chico was on, did it stop anywhere before it got to Havana? Yeah, it had to refuel at Santiago de Cuba. You don't think... Oh, shit. You gotta be kidding me. He does this now? It's 60 miles from Santiago to the prison camp. Chico used to cross the mountains with the older Sandinistas like it was nothing. He'll make that in three days. Still, even if he does find his way there... You know how reckless he can be. Chico thinks we've abandoned Paz. That's why he's doing this. We'll start by having the intel detachment in Cuba look for him. We can't let him be captured. Chico talks, he could blow the new cover up. We can't hold off until the inspection's over. When can we be ready? It'll take at least 16 hours to confirm the flight path and prep a bird. The intel unit has started reconning the area. Sounds like I'll have to miss the inspection. Boss, we'll just have to send someone else to get them out. No. I'll go. Yeah. Chico and Paz would only take orders from you anyway. We can't go taking on those Marines at the base head-on. It's gotta be off the radar. And it's got to be you. Hold down the fort, Koss. Snake, you can forget about civil liberties where you're headed. God only knows what they'd do to you if you got caught. Do not let that happen. The Cubans lease the land to the U.S. as a gesture for helping them gain independence from Spain. The deal remains in effect until both countries agree to dissolve it or the U.S. abandons the land. That's why America still operates the base even after La Revolución. Problem is, it's leased land. Meaning it isn't American soil, so the U.S. Constitution doesn't apply there. That allows them to withhold its civil rights protections. Yeah, that's Uncle Sam's excuse. The area was originally only for detaining refugees from countries like Cuba and Haiti. But a few years ago, the CIA and its likes started using it as a black site. Enemies of the state are renditioned there and subjected to extreme forms of interrogation. You can bet Cypher had a hand in that. 
As you'd expect, American and other Western human rights organizations aren't allowed anywhere near the place. What happens there disappears down the memory hole. Who knows what they're doing to Chico and Paz? I'd like to interrogate her ourselves. But if worse comes to worst, make sure she's dead. Chico, on the other hand, we have to bring back. Fast. He knows too much about us. Cos. The area is surrounded by mines placed by both the U.S. and Cuba, making escape on foot impossible. You're heading into the lion's den, Snake. Don't take this one lightly. Come back in one piece. Yeah. Sure. I'm in Cuba. Security looks lighter than I thought. I wonder where Paz is. East dark, but there are soldiers everywhere. Lots of choppers coming and going. Those lights are so bright. Time to get moving. close to the fence to see if I could spot her. They had a guard posted, so I got out of there. Guess security's not so light after all. I'm coming, Paz. I'm okay. I'm... I'm okay. I think I found her! It's gotta be Pat! No, no, no! I'm looking for me. Order. At least whoever finds this will know what happened. <laughs> They're holding others here too. Still no sign of pass.
me, you son of a bitch. She looks weak. We need her alive. Yes, sir. Buzz. Huh? You're back early today. Early? And the sun is still up. to you. But I came here to... Just be quiet. Uh -huh. Or I'll scream. What the... I don't get it. On your feet. Okay. Does it hurt? Talk. Talk. You can speak, can't you? Then talk. Okay. Okay. 
Good boy. Your boss and I go way back. Don't count on him coming to rescue you. If you're a real soldier, you'll find your own way out. But don't bother trying to escape. Let's say you get lucky, and you don't look very lucky. And by some miracle, you get out of your cage. Let's even say you're able to elude the guards. Then what? The nearest Cuban border is four miles to the east. Four miles of barren America-controlled soil. Think you'd make it? You wouldn't get any help from the Cubans. And the border's a mess of live minefields. Think you'd make it through that? With your girlfriend in tow? If you were that lucky, you wouldn't even be here right now. But don't lose hope. There's another way out, for both you and the girl. This way is... much simpler. I ask, you answer. Easy, right? Just tell me what you know. You are dumber than you look. Wasting your time torturing kids. No! Tell me about your base. Chico. Well? Chico! Uh... Hit me! Again! <laughs> Trying to impress the girl, little man. How cute. All right. Let's try something else. Stop it! She'll get what she deserves. We were comrades once. But she betrayed us. Deception and deceit. What better proof she's a real woman? Show him! Do you realize what you're doing? Cypher is watching. Let go of me! You will be next! Your hideous face will... Impulsive, isn't it? Look. Look carefully. Watch out when you grow up, boy. This is the kind of woman you want to avoid. Of course, scars like those make it rather difficult to lead a normal life. I should know. Continue. Talk, and you both go free. Chico! No! Only you can stop this. Don't talk! Chico! Why? Move. 
Get up. Huh? You heard me. Do you like what you see? I said, do you like what you see? It's like fruit. Does she look sweet or sour? A man has to know these things. Time for a taste test. Either you take her now, or you're strung up next. Leaders. Seek. And again. See, that wasn't so hard. You got what you wanted. Are you satisfied? We're halfway there. didn't want to talk to me. There's one thing I want to say. What? I missed you, Chico. Enough already. You want to do it here? him back to his cage. What did I do? Have it back. We've decided to let her go. So she talked. 
told her she should have just gotten it over with. She's going back to your boss. But only her. Huh? Those were the terms. She said to leave you here. I suppose she doesn't much care for you anymore. That bitch! Now, you've got quite a problem on your hands. When she gets back, what will she say? That you talked? Sold out your comrades? Your family? You're finished. You mean I... I can't go home? There's very little I can do for you. And I still have need of your services. Huh? You're going to call your boss for help. We'll make a recording, played across public frequency bands. To bring him here? Yeah, all right. Do you expect me to trust you? I'll never help you! Perhaps, but if you did, I wouldn't mind looking the other way if he did come for you. Take some guards off duty, let you quietly slip away. But, you wouldn't want the girl leaving here alive. She'd have to be eliminated before he came. There's no other way. I'll leave you to think it over. Chico. Growing up means choosing how you're going to live your life. Snake. It's Chico. I need your help. Cypher's holding me on a U.S. military base in Cuba. Paz is here too. We're at the prison area on the coast. There are some cages to the east of a big building. East an old... grassy facility. That's where we are. Help me, Snake. Don't. Don't do it. Kids are natural, don't you think? What do you think Big Boss will do? He'll know it's a trap, but he'll come anyway. That's the kind of man he is. Don't! Thanks to your report, a nuclear inspection team's being sent to their base. The scientist was our way in. It all ends soon, exactly as I've planned. All thanks to you. Cypher... Who would never... Yes, Cypher will surely mourn his death. I'll have no choice but to distance myself from the group. And then they'll eliminate you. No one will be left. Think about that. Big Boss or Cypher? You can only save one. I will never talk. I don't expect you to believe me. The question is, which of the two would you like to give a shot at survival? What I would like. The feeling is mutual, but we are secret agents. Restraint is a virtue. Your favorite song, Nicola Bart, immigrants wrongly executed. 
but their death served as a message to others. That ours is a society that murders the innocent. Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? If so, the time is now. Cypher's been in hiding ever since his grand experiment. No one's seen him in years. All we hear are orders delivered by proxy. Except you. You met with him, face to face, in order to contact Big Boss. Tell me where he is. Where is Cypher? Where is Zero? I've never known choice. Where I was born, the language I speak, I've never had the freedom to choose for myself. But you, right now, are free. Do as you will. This will save Big Boss. It may. Will you really kill Zero for me? Not for you. All right. Zero is... already hold her still <clears throat> prep the package she's all closed up timer set for your instructions we can't have her waking up or dying on us. I gave her a transfusion, a nutrient cocktail, and an anesthetic. How long does she have? 24 hours, same as her cargo. She won't last much longer than that. To so make room for the bomb, I removed organs she won't need. Almost there. Now for the second one. In a place they'd never look. Hang her up. You shall not see triumph. You've been most helpful. And I have one last use for you. To you I give a magnificent end. But an end, nonetheless. The final moment is yours. We heard from the advance team. Everything's right on schedule. The C4 has been planted on the legs. The strike team and decoy team are in position. And we have confirmation that Big Boss's chopper has lifted off. A shame I won't see him, but at least I'll get a look at his body. Time for us to move out too. But first, let's stop by and see the boy. I want Big Boss to hear his little diary. Hopefully, he's still a good listener. Give this to the boy as a reward, and a memento. Make copies. Yes, sir. First big boss, then zero. Liberation is at hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Chico. I am borrowing your recorder. I hope you do not mind. I know it hurts right now, but it will all be over soon. Just thinking that helps keep the pain away. Chico, I would do anything to get you out of here. It is funny. I have never helped anyone else before. Only Cypher. That is the truth. I never imagined you would come for me. I was not very nice at first, I know. But I did not mean it. I... I was afraid they would try to use you somehow. But to be honest, having you with me here put my mind at ease. I hope that does not sound selfish. I thought I would never make it. But together, I think we can. I'm watching you sleep as I record this. You have made me believe that I will make it out of here. And that no matter what happens, it will not be the end for me. Thank you, Chico. You've done your part. You told us plenty. You've known the pain of ages. And even now you think, as any person would, that this can't be happening. Is it education? Morals? Faith? Just the imprint of a lifetime of stories? Face to face with oblivion, which is where you are, and you still think that help is coming. The world you were born into is made to save you. Isn't that right? Of course it is. Everyone knows that. Until your last breath, you know it. Without the slightest chance or reason left to them, humans are capable of hope. I'm no different. But for one thing, when my time came calling, I didn't die. My family died, my country died, but they didn't take me with them. All hell took from me was this skin, this outer peel that marked me human. My village had an oilseed field and a fine factory. Every day my friends and I would see our parents at work in that factory. That's all I had. 
all the world I knew. Then one day, aircraft came droning in from some far off sky. The factory was bombed. Some spies had told them we were making weapons. The building burned. We tried to flee outside. The crowd blocked the exit. The crowd of people. Hot. So hot. I tried to push through their legs and get ahead, but a boot in my stomach put me on the ground. The smoke of them burning filled me up. I heard my name called, but not for long. At the infirmary they carried me to, a nurse in the corridor saw me and remarked, as if it happened every day, they should let the poor thing die. Those are the only words of my mother tongue I remember. It was the language of my village. Until foreign troops invaded, then the last identity I had left, the words I spoke, were pulled from me. My skin would never feel anything again. This face would be burned again, in torture, at foreign hands. But I, I still writhe in that burning factory, doused in scalding rapeseed oil. That's all I have to feel, that pain. All I have to remind me I exist here. <laughs> Those spies reported well. We made weapons, all right. As cartloads of rifles came in from the battlefields, we fixed them up and sent them back out. So our country could win. Or rather, so that little world we knew could continue. I came to realize I mustn't die. I'm their last hope. All those who perished and left me here. I have to accomplish something. If I don't, their will will be swept out of this world. So? Do you see me now? Tell me. What do you see? Hmm? You have eyes. What do your eyes see? <laughs> yes, that's right. You see a skull face. You see me. This skull is who I am. My mark, my proof of humanity. I have no country, no language. I have no face. But I haven't lost my skull. So I told myself, the pain and effort that keep me alive will never know relief, never bear fruit, never be repaid. I know that, but I told myself to focus on some hope, a non-existent hope, to guide me through this burning world. A hope. Call it a dream. A melancholic delusion. As the pressures within me stretch me to bursting, and I force myself not to cry out, though the words I thought were carved into me are gone, and all I knew is dead. I know how you feel. I've felt that. So show me that I'm not the only one, that you too can return to this world for revenge. Do you see me? Don't die. Don't die! Ah. 